remind me of that fellow's name? Father Dave, this is Mandy. It's Howells is the last one. Uh, Herbert Howells. Howells. And Howells lost a son tragically and his heart was absolutely broken and he was in grief for years and he was offered the opportunity to to write that hymn tune for that beautiful text which is all about God's hope and he it kind of when he got the offer to write that hymn he it was Easter day and he was sitting at his dining room table and that song just came to him um, and he composed it kind of all at once as he sat there at his uh, dining room table. So it's a pretty neat backstory to that wonderful hymn. And I want to thank Betsy, Elizabeth, and Marissa Hall, and everyone for coordinating that last hymn. It was just so moving. Um, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to lead you through a brief overview of St. John's plan for regathering. There won't be time for a lot of discussion or questions in this setting, but please know that on Wednesday, I'll be leading a, um, about a half hour forum at six o'clock from six to 6.30, where you will have the opportunity to ask more questions and we can uh, dialogue about the plan. Keep in mind, theologically speaking, that what we see throughout the Bible is that because of various things, including disease, people are scattered by circumstances that life throws at us, and God is in the gathering business. God is always knitting together God's people. That's what God does, and that's what is already happening on Zoom and through online worship. Um, as our Director of Communications, Mandy Schnicker, often reminds us, um, you know, St. John's has never stopped being church. We've, you know, we're still assembling, we're still gathering, it's just in a different way, um, and the Lord knows, though, when we can finally get back together in person, uh, our next normal, it is going to be a joyful, joyful day. Okay, so without any further ado, I'm going to ask Claire if she could please share her screen so that you can see this slideshow we've prepared for you. I love that, that watercolor of the, uh, the bell tower. <laughs> it looks so cool. Um, so just know that if you want to view the full plan, you can do so on the St. John's website, and all of the information is right there. Um, you'll see it right here under the news section on that top right. Just look for regathering plan, and you can see the whole thing and all of its glory. Thanks be to God for our COVID-19 task force chaired so ably by Skip Foster. And we're really, really grateful, especially to Dr. Zorn, Don Zorn, as well as Dr. Laura Brock, who are the chief architects of the regathering plan. Uh, we really wanted this to be uh, based on data. And what you'll notice is every movement in, in this plan, um, Claire, you can go to the next slide. Every movement, whether it goes up or down, and we all have to remain flexible, will be based on data, you know, 14 days worth of local data having to do with the virus. So right now we're still at level one. We were very, very close to going to level two a couple of weeks ago, but then unfortunately we've all seen the numbers climbing. So we stayed at level one. But again, I just want to underscore this, that um, you know, this has been a wild ride so far, and it may be that let's say we go to level two, we might have to go back to level one because of the data. So, um, or if things improve, then we could go to level three. So you, you see we could go up and down on the plan. Uh, next slide, please, Claire. So our level one highlights, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's essentially where we are right now. Um, online worship, online meetings, um, you know, certain staff members are on campus, but the campus, of course, is uh, officially closed. Pastoral care is happening by phone and online. Um, and, you know, we, we have been able to do uh, prayers at the end of life with people through FaceTime and, and virtual means. So that is uh, possible. Just, just I want to make sure you know that we're doing everything we can to minister to people who may be in the hospital or in difficulty. Um, you'll also notice that uh, Fran, we call it a soft start. That's what restaurants very often call it. We're on the road back to offering takeout at the cafe. Uh, you can directly reach out to Fran now for some food. She's kind of uh, testing some things. 
but we, right after Labor Day, will do an official launch of takeout, a uh, very safe, you know, contactless payment. You can order online, all of that good stuff. That'll happen right after Labor Day. You'll also notice that um, we're doing weddings, funerals, and baptisms, 10 or fewer people, and that can happen on campus. Just get in touch with clergy. We're super safe about it. Everyone's wearing masks, and of course, they're socially distanced, and we can also um, have virtual broadcasts um, available of those pastoral events. Next slide, please, Claire. Okay, so level two, which is where we almost went a couple of weeks ago. Um, let me give you a high level summary of, of level two, which is actually where I'm gonna spend most of the time because I'm sure you're wondering what, what um, will come next. So um, in terms of level two highlights, online worship continues, however, this is the big difference. The church will be open on Sundays from two to five for quiet prayer and meditation. These are not worship services as much it is as a time for you to get into the church and just enjoy the beauty of the newly renovated St. John's. Um, you have to sign up online. So we'll have a 10 person max and you'll be able to spend about a half hour in the church uh, for prayer. Also communion in cars. We're still working out details, but uh, communion will be available to the um, kind of people can drive in to receive, and that likely will take place in the parking lot right behind the bookstore, where you'd be able to come in from two to five, and a clergy person would be there with all appropriate precautions to distribute Holy Communion in your cars. Um, you'll notice that for gatherings, we'll, um, you know, pastoral care remains online. Um, groups of 10 or fewer may meet at the church by appointment with appropriate precautions, and um, all other big gatherings are still done online. And in terms of the campus, the buildings are still closed except by appointment, okay? So it's, it's in the next level where the campus gets a little bit more open. Um, so I'm going to shift to level three highlights, please. Oh, I'm sorry, level three, Claire. This is the continued mitigation uh, phase. We're getting closer to a full gathering. Um, we begin to have people in the online worship services in church. So uh, one thing that we're thinking about right now is we would continue, um, quote unquote, taping worship, but we would do so with um, a 50 person maximum in the sanctuary. Um, the, the larger gatherings, education, coffee hour, et cetera, are still happening online. We have slightly larger groups that can meet at the church, 25 or fewer. And here, pastoral care um, at the rector's discretion can be done in person, whether it's in a home or a healthcare setting. Our church administrative offices open up uh, with precautions, and we can have pastoral occasions with 50 or fewer people. So you'll see that at every step, we're being as cautious as possible. And again, the move from level to level is based entirely on local data. We can move to level four, please, Claire. Here, we are getting closer to the next normal with limited restrictions, which looks like the following. So we continue, on, and by the way, I wanna make sure everyone knows, um, I'm so excited about this. We now have a full camera capability in the big church. So sooner than later, probably in the month of August, we're hopeful, you'll begin to see worship services um, taking place in the big church with um, you know, the new system. We actually um, had a funeral this past week for Virginia McMullen that we were able to broadcast and I have, to, I have to say the, um, the quality of the audio and the, and the video was ex far exceeded my expectations. So I couldn't be happier about that. So um, we'll continue to stream services. We'll have 50% capacity in in-person worship. So a significantly larger group of people in the church. Our choir is expanded. Um, we do begin to have some education and meetings in person though uh, they will continue to also be online. Small groups will be meeting at the church. 
and we'll have in-person pastoral care and outreach. The cafe continues to serve food. And at this level, you're going to begin to see people back in the uh, cafe eating in person. Uh, we'll also have a, a larger groups of, for weddings, funerals, and baptisms. And at level five, the next normal, basically that's um, going to be uh, very limited restrictions in terms of attendance in person. Um, you know, one thing I can tell you though is that for um, the next normal, you know, there's still going to continue to be safety protocols in place, particularly around Holy Communion. Um, so it may not exactly be like, you know, like it was before the pandemic, but it's going to be really close. Um, it is about 12 after, and I'm wondering, uh, Mandy or others, did I miss anything that was important to mention? I don't think so. Um, this is Mandy. I just wanted to let you all know that the levels that we just went through can be found on the regathering page. That's the page that's up on your screen right now. Um, you'll be able to see uh, a little thing that says click here. You can see all those highlights. And also, you'll see at the bottom right of your screen, we are doing that Q&A that Father Dave mentioned. There is a direct link to that class on that page. And um, that will take you right there on Wednesday. Thank you so much, Mandy. Um, so again, on Wednesday, if you have questions, I encourage you to attend the forum, which will be on Zoom. Just go to the Church at Home webpage and uh, click to join that at 6 o'clock from 6 to 6.30. We'll do another run through, but this time there'll be more chance for a Q&A. It is great to see everyone this morning. I want to welcome you to this coffee talk with uh, your clergy team. And in today, I couldn't be happier that my friend, Pastor Derek McGee, has joined us, and Mother Abby has let me know that he has signed on. Um, Derek, we want to welcome you to this online community. I wish we could be together in person, but it's great to be uh, with you this morning, and we're really, really grateful that you've made the time to join us today for this series called We Will With God's Help. That is, we will work for racial justice and reconciliation, knowing that God is that wind at our backs. And um, I have to say, I couldn't be happier that Derek's joined us for many reasons, but um, chiefly because he really is a good friend of mine that I've known now for several years. Uh, Derek and I um, worked together on the God Squad. That's our uh, group that was, is associated with the Village Square. And I really enjoyed learning from him, listening to him, and just um, getting to know him as a person and his family. Um, he is an amazing pastor of the Bible-based church here in Tallahassee, and he also works locally as a lobbyist. And uh, Derek, I'm going to let you take it from here, and just know there's a lot of people virtually clapping right now to welcome you uh, to St. John's. We're so grateful for your time. Um, so I'm going to just uh, turn it over to you, and we're going to have a great discussion this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you all can hear me well. Um, I have AirPods, and if that doesn't work, let me know. But thank you so much for the privilege to be here today. You know, it's always a pleasure, my friend, to see you. Um, I want to give special thank yous to uh, Mother Abby and also to Jim Messer. Um, Jim reached out to me um, last month or two months ago with this idea, and I'm very honored. I never take it for granted whenever I'm given the privilege to be able to um, be in conversation with anyone, whether, whether individually or corporately. So I'm very honored about this. I must also share with you that I'm, I am overly impressed by the number of people on them. Um, I'm kind of zoomed out after three months of social distancing would, would work. And so I'm um, in that regard. And so this morning, I want to just, I want to talk to you from, from my heart uh, about something and a lot, of, a lot of great dialogue. And so when I was asked about a topic, um, what I submitted was, was the topic of um, does black does black lives really matter? I want to talk less about the movement or question. I think that's important um, because there are individuals who will argue um, if the movement is politically motivated, if it's financially adhered to, 
for me, it's less about the movement, more about the question, because if the question is being asked, that means that there is a population of people who are asking the question. It also means the population of people who are asking the question also means that there's not an answer given to the question that's being asked. And so I have the great privilege and honor of being, um, as Father Dave mentioned, not only a pastor of a local church, but also a lobbyist. And so I'm involved in two different arenas of, with individuals. Um, as of August 8th of this year, our church will, be, will celebrate 10 years of ministry existence in Tallahassee. Um, so I'm very honored by God's trust. So trust me to be the, the planting pastor. Um, I'm entering 21 years of ministry. And so I've been in, I've been in church my entire, high, my entire life, um, been a Christian for, for many years. Um, and I've been a part of churches mainly that have been predominantly African-American. And the Black church experience is much different. Um, than, than other church gatherings. And sometimes people have ex take exception to the phrase black church, but I would just educate people that the word, that the phrase black church actually came from, um, from segregation time. We were not allowed to go to um, the, the white church with, with, with the slave masters or with the whites, depending on what part of the country you lived in. So they dubbed the black church, which was the, the black slaves or blacks, even after the slavery was over, would convene out in the outhouse or in the backyard and it was labeled the Black Church. And so we've carried that name even 2020, but the Black Church experience is more of a call and a response, meaning I preach, my members yell out, amen, hallelujah, so on and so forth. But it's also a, a community amongst that. It's a community because uh, what's found in the Black Church is, is safety. What's found in the Black Church is safety because uh, when, when we were unable, as a race was unable to gather with other races, not like ourselves, we all had to come together as one. Place. And so there's a, there's a safety there. So whenever you hear um, Black Lives Matter, it's, it's, it, th that, those three words something different depending upon who you talk to. So when you ask the question of the Black Lives Matter, I, I wanna first start with it from a Christian standpoint, because as a believer of Jesus Christ, as a person trying to live his life to follow the, the, the examples that God lays out in his holy word, um, I, I live my life with that everyone's life matter because it matters to God. Um, I don't get into the, the fighting of, of sexual orientation, of political ideology. I look at people as individuals and that is that if I cut you, you bleed red, like I would bleed red, so you're an individual. When you press the point of does black lives matter, the question of that is because whenever you are seeing another example of a black man um, dying at the hands of law enforcement, dying at the hands of, of any individual, um, and, and, and the, 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 the law seems to respond differently, it, it poses a question to you are you are applying for a job and you qualify or overqualify and you still get passed over, the question begs to be asked. And so when that question is being asked, especially from a generational perspective, it's much different. As a Christian, what, what was challenging at times is, is that, we, that at times as Christians, we allow political ideology and, and news media become the dictator as to how we treat one another. Meaning if we don't share the same ideology based on our politics, Republican, Democrat, dependent, then I may treat you differently. I am a Christian black man. And so why is that important? Because the Christian part governs everything else about me. Now, I can't change that I'm black, but because I'm Christian, I conduct myself a certain way. Why is that important? It's important because as a Christian, I try to live my life to be able to honor people the way I believe God would honor them. And so when you look at what's going on in our world, let's do George Floyd for example. When the George Floyd situation happened, here is why it was, it's so, it was and still so hard for, for African-American, especially African-American men to swallow is because we all in that steel image put ourselves on the ground as George Floyd. We all saw that treatment happening to us. We've all been there, maybe not a, a knee to our neck, but we, we put ourselves there where we've been profiled, we've been, we've been followed, we've been falsely accused, we've been, we, whatever it may be, we've been there. And so we, the question was, we asked yeah, ourselves, what's different from that happening to him and happening to us. And so my challenge is because 
to then deal with the anger and the rage have based on what I see. I'm also a father of two awesome children. One happens to be my 14 year old son. So now I'm raising a young black man in an America and I'm raising him to believe that he can, he can excel and meet his dreams, but also batter with fear and timidity because I do wonder if my son will be able to see the fullness of what he desires to do. There's something that ha happens in the, black, in the black community amongst black families that, that other races may have to deal with, which is we call it the talk, with the sound with your children and give them the talk. If you get pulled over, this is how you need to behave. It's what you need to say, not need to say. This is how you need to conduct yourself. And here is why. Because the ultimate desire for our children is get home safely. And so we can live another day to be able to fight the fight of if it was injustice, if it was illegal treatment. But for the, for the most part, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. Um, keep your hands clear on the steering wheel, whatever, whatever it may be, so that you can get home safely to explain what happened and then we can fight it a different way. Now, why is that talk necessary? Because, when, again, whenever you see a still image or a live video or recorded video of something happening to an African-American, we all instantly put ourselves in that treatment. Then you look at it from a church perspective is, is, is Dr. King said the most segregated hour of the day is 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, where he said you can work amongst other races, but on Sundays we're going to depart to our, our comfortable setting. And, and that's not just, you know, white Americans running to their church, but it's also black Americans running to their churches as well, because there's some safety that takes place there. There is a tug of war that takes place. So when Black Lives Matter first started moving and started being asked, it has created a movement that, that, that has, taken, has taken on its own wind that even poses a concern for me as well, because whenever there is a lack of a clear leadership in a movement, it becomes dangerous. But to the 1960s, Dr. King and others were the face of what was going on. Even this week, Congressman John Lewis, a great civil rights leader, um, just died. And, and, and Congressman Lewis would talk about um, sometimes you had to get in, good, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. And he was talking about burning buildings down, but at this point, you had to stand for righteousness sake. And so as a Christian, there are times when things happen in our world um, to, to, to our race that we do look and wonder, where are our white brothers and sisters? Where are the white clergy during these times? And there are some in Tallahassee who who stand firm, bold, and they, they verbally express um, their disdain for injustice. And there are some others who are very, very quiet, in my opinion, at the wrong time. <laughs> I believe 100% that if you are a believer of Jesus of the Bible, that Jesus stood against social injustice. I believe, if you believe Jesus of the Bible, that Jesus stood with the least of these, that he had, a, he had compassion for those that, that, that the government of the time did not take into consideration. And so I don't think that it is pleasing when we, when we separate ourselves from a brother or sister who is being um, mistreated or, 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 or being taken advantage of. And so for me, when people ask me, does Black Lives Matter? Uh, when I ask that question, I'm asking it from the standpoint of scripturally and from a Christian standpoint, do you believe that black lives matter. Now, Christians will always say, yes, I believe that. So the next question must be, what are we doing, the collective we doing to make sure that we are, we are, we are not saying it, but we're actually showing that it matters. I'm a believer, brothers and sisters, that you can resolve a lot of life's issues with a table and a meal between you. I believe that. I believe you sit down and break bread together. You can, you can, you can, you can walk away and still have disagreements. But you have respect for one another. Let me give you a great example. Father, Father Day opened up talking about part of my resume. Talk about Faithful Friday. When Faithful Friday first got put into place, I didn't know Dave Colleen. I didn't know Jack Rumberg. I didn't know Doug Dortch, who used to be the pastor of First Baptist. They didn't know me either. Um, and I got invited to be a part of of this great inaugural gathering. Um, and if you ever came to any of, in the earlier years, my ideology and Jack Romberg's ideology were so far apart from each other. We, we actually, at a third point, took, took pleasure in fighting each other and arguing each other. And then Jack and I one day had an idea, let's go, let's go, let's go have breakfast together. Sit down and have breakfast together. 
And to our amazement, we find ourselves laughing about the same things, but also teary out over the same thing. There were things that were breaking my heart that were also breaking Jack's heart. Now, Jack is a Jewish rabbi. I am a black Christian pastor. There are some people who have a hard time with ever accepting us be having breakfast, let alone becoming friends. But we came to the realization that we both had a heartbreak of what we were witnessing in our community and in our world. And what became important in that gathering was, was less about ideology and more about humanity. And that's where it, it, it comes to the core of everything is humanity, is seeing each other as human beings, is understanding that, that, that the Bible that I read, that the fellowship that I have based on the Bible that I read requires of me to see you, my brother, you, my sister, as a human being with feelings. Jack and I became friends. We remain friends to this day. Um, I've broken bread at Jack's house. I've been able to speak at the temple a couple of times when Jack was there. Um, we still, again, converse to this day. But, but we didn't start out that way. But we realized something. You could do a lot of things at a table with a meal. You do a lot of things if you're willing to sit down and not try to convert people, but try to converse with people. And that's, that's a very important point, but also a difference, is understanding that, that I may not leave this table having fully persuade you to think the way I think, but I walked away with a better understanding of how you think and how you see life. Unless you are a black man, you'll never understand what it means to be a black man in America. Like I'll never understand what it means to be a white man, a white woman in America. There are some, some fears that I have that others may never understand. When I'm driving in my car, um, I'm overly conscious and cautious of uh, when the speed limit changes. I'm overly conscious and cautious of where I'm going. I'll give you a quick example of something that happened to me about three years ago. Went to a local grocery store. I had just left from working out with my trainer. I still had on workout attire. Um, and was, I got out my truck and was getting ready to go into the store and a lady um, saw me coming and she clutched her purse um, as I was walking past her. And I saw it and she saw that I saw what she did. And, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't show it to her, but as she walked past me, my eyes teared up. This was in the two, this was 2018 when this took place. And I was thinking to myself, no matter what I do, I'll probably never get beyond that. Later that same day, I, I home, by the time I'd gone home and showered and changed, put on a business suit, and went back to that same store on the way home, and I got compliments from people in the same store because my attire was professional. I'm the same guy that I was earlier that morning. My attire was different, but I'm the same person. And when I got in my car that evening, I sat in my car for about 15 minutes, really processing what had transpired, that the same person can get, the, can get different treatment based on the attire. That earlier that morning, I was threatening to someone because of the attire I had on. That evening, I was complimented based on what I was wearing. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not an unusual scenario. That is very normal um, in, in for me and others like me on an everyday period. Now, because I am a Christian, because I believe in God, um, I am able to lean on my faith when, 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 when others are reacting a different way. I'm able to kind of calm people through conversation because you don't resolve the matters by creating more violence and more tension. So when the question is asked, does Black Lives Matter? Of course the answer is yes. Of course the answer is yes. And yes, all lives matter too. But when we're saying Black Lives Matter, we're not saying that an exception of other lives. What we're saying is that when you say all lives matter, make sure you're including that Black Lives Matter in the all lives. It's not a fight between blue lives matter, all lives matter. It's saying an all inclusiveness is that a black person or a white person or human themselves, we all matter. Is that I want the same things other people want, which is I want to be able to live in a community where I'm safe, where my children can go outside and play and have fun, where they can interact with kids of other races, where my children want to live in Tallahassee beyond high school and raise their families. I want that same desire, goal, aspiration. I'm a first generation college student, first generation college graduate. Um, first generation um, of a homeowner, in, in, especially on my dad's side of the family. And so um, I'm living on the shoulders of generations before me. I understand the, the, the fight that they had to endure. 
for me to have the privileges that I have. I teach my children, as does my wife, teach our children to show respect to every person. I'll conclude this way and we'll open it up. My son, who's now going to the ninth grade, um, earlier this, this, past, this past school year, my son played football. They go to Florida High. They had a football game against a local, against, against a school, not only in county, one of our neighboring counties had a football game. My son plays defense. He's pretty good. Um, he gets his skills from his father. Um, that's a joke, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but he's pretty good. My son tackles the quarterback. He sacks the quarterback. And my son gets up. And, and knowing my son gets up, and usually he'll help the quarterback up. That's really what he does afterward. He's not really a showboat. And this time, I saw his behavior differently. He, he, he was very upset. And I could see it from the stands. He was upset about something. And he pushed the quarterback down again. The, 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 um, the official threw the flag. My son gets a personal foul penalty. I run down the bleachers to the fence trying to figure out what's going on. I'm yelling to one of the coaches, what's going on? The head coach is on the field. My son is enraged. And my son is a very calm, spirited child. He's enraged. Um, he's yelling, hands are thrown up. So I proceed to get ready to jump the fence. True story. I to jump the fence. My wife grabs me and pulls me back down, reminding me that I'm a pastor. And that you may want to be careful about what you're about to do because although that is your son, you're also a pastor. And there's some people from our church here at this game. This is all happening. And my son comes to the sidelines and he has his helmet off. And I can see that my son is distraught. And I'm yelling, his name is Derek also. I'm yelling, Derek, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? One of the coaches come over to me. Um, they have my son in the circle talking to him. One coach come over to me and said, Dad, it's going to be okay. I said, what happened? After my son tackled, tackled the quarterback, this quarterback, who's also in the eighth grade at the same time, jumped up, the, jumped, looked at my son and said, you stupid effing nigger. And my son snapped because my son had seen movies where the N-word had been used. My son, when he's in the third grade, had been called a nigger by a classmate. But this time, he had actually helped the quarterback up after sacking him. And the quarterback's response was, you stupid effing nigger. And my son snapped. What made my son even more enraged was that the official not only witnessed it, but heard a young man say it. The official said to my son, get over it and keep playing. And my son was crying because he said, dad, it's not fair. And why didn't he, why didn't he do anything about it? And so on the way home from that game, it was a conversation that was uncomfortable, but it was necessary um, because I was naive to assume that I could wait a few more years before I had a conversation with my son. I couldn't. And I said to him, I said, D, I said, I want to say two things to you. Number one, you're not a nigger. You're not, a, you're not ignorant at all. You are an intelligent young black man. And I'm sorry that it happened to you. I said, number two, I want to say to you that we have to learn from this. We have to learn that there are some people who will always see you that way. But also you have to learn there are many other people who don't see you that way. I want to conclude my point with that because the same advice I gave my son, I give to myself on a regular basis is that for every racist person that you may encounter, there are so many more who don't have that same viewing. There are some people who may just be ignorant to or lack the intelligence of your history. And so they're not racist, they're just without information as I am on other things of that matter. So when we say Black Lives Matter, for me, it's not a movement that I'm advancing. It is a statement of remember that in all lives matter, Blacks do as well. And because we are believers of God, I, we start our lives in that mindset that my desire is I want to represent Christ in the earth, regardless of my skin tone. And so I thank you for that. I'm happy to follow whatever the lead is after this. Uh, Derek, thank you so much for your Sir. presentation. Um, I'd like to start, and I, I do want this to be a, a community discussion. And so I'd like to encourage those of you, because of the size of our group, you may want to use the chat function of Zoom to submit questions. Um, you could also come off of mute, but it's, it'll be a little tricky given the size of the group. So try to use that chat function and you can send out the questions and we'll be monitoring that. Um, I'd, I'd like to get the discussion started, Derek, by asking you, um, you know, recently Asheville, North Carolina made the bold step to begin a process of uh, reparations and specifically focusing on building intergenerational wealth for African Americans in the Asheville area. Can you uh, say a word about 
your your uh, feelings about reparations and the the move that was taken by the government in Asheville. Thank you. So, so I will first say it's commendable with an asterisk next to it. And here's why I say that. Um, because I've always argued this point, that before you can deal with racial reconciliation, you must first acknowledge that you need to do racial restoration. It's important to remember that for so many years, African Americans were only seen as three-fifths of a person. And so I, I, I encourage reconciliation, but you first must restore me back, restore me to being a whole man. What Asheville is doing is, is commendable because not only, are they, not only are they acknowledging years of, of, of racial tension um, and, and injustice, they're also trying to do something about going forward. Brothers and sisters, what's important to know about, about intergenerational um, wealth is, is, is for, for many facets, including in Leon County, there were many facets in minority communities that there is generational poverty, where there are third and fourth and fifth generation of individuals who have never ever been in a position to own anything. They are literally, their biggest goal is to get their own government subsidized housing apartment. They don't want to live with their mom anymore. And so um, what, 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 was, what my, many minorities don't have that, that maybe our white brothers and sisters may have or others is, is that we know we don't start out in a position to own. We're usually gonna always be the employee, not the employer. We don't start out in a position to be able to, to, to lend um, um, monies in that regard. So what Asheville is doing, I commend it. My asterisk is important because the important thing about intergenerational wealth is not just having the conversation, but it's also putting the systems in place to make sure that you're educating individuals before, during, and after you put them in a position to be able um, to, to grow wealth. It is, it is it's a sad commentary, it's a, it's a dangerous commentary to put wealth in the hands of somebody who lacks the intellect to know what to do with it. And so that's my asterisk, but I commend them because you have to start somewhere. And let me, let me also say this to, to all of you and I'll pause the next question. Um, it is never an easy time to have the race conversation, but it's always the right time to have the race conversation. It is very uncomfortable to talk about racial injustice. It just is. But it's still the right time to have the conversation because um, movement forward cannot happen if we don't acknowledge there was a pause somewhere. Thank you, Derek. Um, we have a question. This is coming from Jim Messer. Yeah. Um, how, how do we respond to people who say, of course, black lives matter, but all lives matter? Shouldn't that be the focus? And then also, Jim adds another um, question here. Sorry, my chat screen keeps scrolling. Um, <laughs> um, it, more troubling um, is this question. Isn't Black Lives Matter um, a Marxist organization? Do you have a, uh, any thoughts on, on those? I do. And I guess you can see Jim's question as well. So the, on the first one, um, um, Jim, here's what I would say to you. Here's how you respond to it. You respond by saying, yes, of course all lives matter, comma, but do you believe that in that, that black lives matter as well? Because what, what I think has happened, and this, this goes to your question number two, I think what happens because of the Black Lives, Move, black lives Matters movement has taken off, and it is you know, there is parts of it I do believe that are, that are, that are um, politically motivated. Because that's taken place, we have lost the focus on the core of the question or the statement. Like I said before, when you say Black Lives Matter, um, I'm not saying that um, in, in ignoring any other life, what I'm saying is please remember that Black Lives Matter, and we could say Black Lives Matter too, to make sure that people understand it should be included in All Lives Matter. Because here's the thing, from, from, from my seat as a black man, I don't have a problem with any other life. But, but, but it, for us, it feels like other lives have a problem with our life. And that's why it is. The second question I will tell you is the most troubling question. And it's the hardest question to answer because um, there are facets of Black Lives Matter 
that I do believe is, is organized with as Marxist or other pieces and is dangerous. I'll go back to years ago when you had the Dream Defenders and they did a sit-in in the Capitol. Um, um, if you're not careful, um, people, pe people would, with ulterior motives or demented mindsets can try to hijack um, genuine desires and motivations. And I think that's important. That goes back even to the civil rights movement. Um, you think about it, the same time that Dr. King was talking about peaceful protest, you had, you had Malcolm X talking about by any means necessary. And so there is a different mindset. There are people who, who will see young people marching peacefully um, for change and will in, in, in fear, in, intrude in that, um, infiltrate into those things to try to advance their own agenda. There are people who want who fund these organizations. All that's true, which is why I open up by saying, I want to do less about the movement and more about the question, because uh, the, the challenge with the movement is, is anything that you do that, that, is, that, that is up for question, is questionable, people then go away from the core of, of, of the movement or the, or, the, or the conversation. And so for the people who say, isn't Black Lives Matter a Marxist organization, there may be some truth to that. I still don't think it, it gives free pass to ignore the question that's being asked of, does Black Lives Matter? Thanks, Derek. Um, I'm kind of looking at some of the other questions here. And the reason I'm reading them out is because I think not everyone is able to see the chat. So okay. Um, okay. I think that the next question, Derek, would be, and I'm going to kind of bring two questions together, Megan's and Dennis's. How can St. John's as a church help to move forward towards racial reconciliation? What actions can we take aside from teaching and conversation? And Megan also asked, do you have recommendation of ways that we, both as individuals and as a, as a parish, can lend our voice, time, talents, and money to dismantle oppressive systems or amplify black lives and voices? And that's strong. So some of you, most of you don't know this. I probably know you probably know this. So um, I've, been, I've been meeting with a few local black clergy since the beginning of, of right after the George Floyd incident. Uh, and then after we had the, 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 the killing, the Tony McDay situation and a young man who died as a result of Tony McDay, I met with several local clergy, um, black clergy had this conversation. I, and I, I, I dubbed the three Ps of, of dealing with any social injustice. It needs to be three Ps. It needs to be um, pulpit, it needs to be, it needs to be, it needs to be protest, pulpit, and then policy. And I said to them, I, it, was, it, was, it was protest last pavement, which is there are going to be some people who are going to be on the pavement protesting. And we need to encourage that peacefully, of course. And then there's pulpit, which means that we all need to be using our pulpits and our voices in the pulpit to speak out against social injustice and against things that are not, that are, that are not um, aligned with the scripture that we believe in. And that's for all races. And then there is policy. The policy pieces where I'm focused on most of my attention because you can do one and two. If you don't know, there are certain policies on in, on, in certain books or, or in, on certain laws or ordinances that keep you oppressed. Does it help you out? That it's hard for me to believe that an organization is desiring to really be diverse if their entire hiring committee are all whites. Your hiring committee to me reflects the heart of your organization. And so if you have no minorities, I'm talking minorities meaning gender and race on your hiring committee, then you really don't have a heart for diversity. You're just using words with no fruit behind it. Bring it to St. John's. I mean, let me first say, I believe that St. John's has done a lot of great work in the community. Um, some that folks may not know you all actually do. You guys took a strong stance on, on, um, on, on same-sex marriages. You took, a, you took a stance on a lot of things that is unpopular um, in certain settings. You took, a, you took a strong stance and you, you stood firm in that stance. Regardless of the differing opinions, you're taking a stance in that regard. Now, why is that important? Because a stance like the one you take in, the ones you take in, it also speaks to the people who have, who have concluded their opinion that the church does not matter anymore. The church does not care anymore. When, you, when you're thinking about decisions that you're making, um, you're thinking about it through two lenses, through the lenses of, will God be pleased? And then number two, um, can we actually minister to the lives of people? And so what St. John's can, I would say, continue doing is things like you're doing right now. These conversations, 
because we're not allowed to be able to gather in large settings, I would tell you things that are important that I've been doing a lot of lately is, is reaching out to people does not look like you, does not think like you, does not live where you live, and, and ask to be able to sit down and break bread together. Listen, I don't drink coffee, but I like to drink tea. You know, I, I love a good meal, especially if you're treating, you know, things of that nature. You know, there's things you can do in fellowship and have conversation that I think is important. St. John's has also always opened up its door for most of the Village Square's events. And so even in that regard, you are, you are playing a role even by being a hosting organization. You're allowing conversations to take place on your campus that other places of, 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 of faith will not let take place. I think the last thing that's important, and I think this is very, very key um, in this regard, is, is consider your circle, the people that, that are in your inner circle, your closest friends. What I, what I, what I encourage um, a, a, a local lawyer who reached out to me for a conversation, I said, here's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you to do. Um, whether it's just your family or it's your family and your friends, one time when you all are gathering or with a meal, engage in a conversation by asking them, hey, what do you think about the current social, um, the, the, the racial unrest in our, in, our, in our country right now? And, just, and let that become the conversation that you have. You'll be, you'll be amazed that your assumption of their thinking is probably not even accurate because there are some people who are really struggling about what's going on. They don't know how to communicate it. Uh, I think for St. John's, be, because I believe you guys are so, in, so intentional and because I've had a chance to fellowship with Father Dave and Mother Abby, and I know their hearts, um, I will tell you that justice ministry is, is always gonna be important in our community. And so what, what you, you, you shouldn't give to everything. I think you ought to be intentional about what you're giving your money toward because you wanna make sure that whatever you give your money toward is actually committed to short-term and long-term change. That's very, very important. But you also want, you want, you want to make sure that you are taking heed and counsel from your spiritual leaders, that, that if they are involved in certain things, you want to try to do your best to come alongside them and aid in that regard. There's a reason why they are involved in that. I think, I think that's important. But before, my, my last point on that, before you give anything financial, always do your research. Always know what you're giving your money toward and why you're doing it. Because just giving your money to say you're giving your money does not give you any gold stars. Sometimes it's better to just have the conversation with people, figure out what's going on. The last one I make on that is what I'm learning even more is there's a generational difference in what's going on. The generation right after me is seeing life different the way I see life. And so they're struggling probably even more than I'm struggling with what's going on. Um, because they were led to believe that the American dream applied to them. So the struggle is a whole lot different. And so in, in your engagement, consider engaging somebody who's younger than you or older than you and talk to them from their, from their generational lens. Derek, thank you. Um, St. John's initiated three years ago, the Community Remembrance Project, Leaders from St. John's, which is an effort to remember victims, the four documented cases of lynchings in right. Leon County. And that uh, the historical marker was recently approved by the city commission and will be installed down by uh, Cascades Park. And of course, it's not just about a historical marker, it's also gonna be about developing an educational curriculum that will help children, youth, and adults learn about our past in the local community and in our nation in terms of uh, racial, uh, racially directed violence towards African Americans. Um, when we began that project, Derek, about three years ago, uh, some of the um, folks in our congregation had concerns and they said, well, you know, isn't that violence a part of our, of our history, but, you know, it's not relevant to us today. I mean, we didn't commit those, those crimes, those horrific crimes? Why should we um, you know, do all this work to have these historical markers? That's an introduction to my main question for you, which is that um, increasingly what we see, uh, it's specifically in the center now that's located in Montgomery, is a, a link historically between slavery, the Jim Crow era, and the era of mass incarceration of people of color, in our nation. Can you, can you um, 
give us a sense of your thoughts about that continuum in American history and in our present. So I'll open up by strongly encouraging, if you haven't seen it yet, if you have Netflix, there's, a, there's something on there called 13th. Um, it's talking about the 13th Amendment. I would strongly encourage you, if you haven't seen it yet, to um, check it out. Um, and it's talking about, it's basically talking about, um, it's, it's almost dubbed the new Jim Crow, which is um, how mass incarceration is taking place, how there's so many African-American men incarcerated. But I, I encourage you to watch it um, because it's eye-opening um, from both lenses of, of the political spectrum. Um, so it's not beating up on Republicans alone. It's also beating up on Democrats. There's some things in there that are eye-opening. Um, but I think it also is important because um, a lot of questions can be answered, especially to the, to the, to the ones who, who say um, that, why are we doing this now? That's, that's, that's so in our past. Um, I'm, I'm only endorsing that because I think it definitely will speak to, the, to that question. That question comes up a lot. Uh, and I will also hit that by saying this. Um, the, the, one of the greatest challenges that I experience is in conversing with people who open by saying, well, Derek, that was so many years ago. Why does that matter now? Um, because for some people who say that to me, they're saying it because they're trying to, con they're con trying to convince me that they don't think that way. And they may not think that way, but here is the fact of the matter. There are many who still do. Um, and so, you, you know, re regardless of our thinking today, slavery will, can never be erased from the history books. It can never be ignored that it took place. It can never be ignored that, that African Americans provided free, free labor um, and while slave owners became great entrepreneurs. That cannot be ignored at all. It cannot be ignored that when, when slaves were released, were, were set free, um, the Emancipation Proclamation later through Juneteenth that we started out as, as at free slaves with nothing. And so a lot of slaves found themselves going back to their slave owners as hired employees because they didn't have anything to start out with. And so those things are true in history that cannot be ignored. Um, there are still some churches um, that in America today who are, who, who, who are not comfortable with Blacks being in their place of worship today. Um, and so these things, although, although it's not as, as blatantly obvious as it was before, it's still happening today. And so I think, think it's important in that regard. What I will also tell you is when, when, when it's said that it, that's in our history, while we're talking about it now, here's the other way I, I would hit, hit that on that is, is that we have to be also be careful is that while it's maybe in our history books, the question has to be asked, who's telling the history story? Because oftentimes, the way the history is written is not written given the full story. It's written through a lens um, to actually soften or water down what really took place. You know, like the same way, the, same way the, the cross of Calvary, the way the, the way the cross of Calvary is preached about in today's churches is really almost an, an embarrassing depiction of the truth. Um, the, 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 the crucifixion was, was, was bloody. You know, it was, it was, it was, um, it's, it's heart-wrenching to think about the agony of it all. And so if you're preaching um, um, without giving the full essence of what it was, it's really hard to appreciate the, 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 the sacrifice that Christ paid for us without acknowledging the pain. Same thing, I, I, I'm not trying to do a direct comparison, but this about with slavery, it, it's hard to move forward in restoration if we first don't deal with uh, what took place. And so, um, you know, the, the, the monuments in Montgomery, the one in Washington, D.C., these things to me are very important. I'll go a little further and give this to you. I, I've never had a problem with statues being erected, even if they're erected, you know, for slave masters or, you know, Confederate, Confederate general. I've never had a problem with it. I've never, I've never argued to tear them down because it's part of history. What I've always argued is two things. Number one is, is if we're going to erect statues, it's also erect statues of people who actually also contributed to our American history as well, some who happen to be African-Americans. And then number two, let's make sure that we contextualize what we're doing and why we're doing it. Like you, it's, that's, that stuff's important as well. Um, and so, you know, 
Is it uncomfortable? It's always uncomfortable because there are people who believe the church's role is limited when it comes to social injustice. And I will argue just the opposite. Um, I would argue that the church should be one of the loudest vo vo voices in times like these. We should be the ones reminding our people um, of our faith and the governance of our faith based on scripture. I think that's very, very important that this is not the time for us to be quiet. And this kind of go back to the earlier question of somebody asked, what can St. John be doing? Um, I think St. John and every other church is, is that when we see social injustice, when we see racial um, unrest, is that we, we have to commit to ourselves not to get quiet at that time. When we, we, we can't use our social media sites only to, to, to retweet um, or to repost a comment from our favorite political um, hero and not talk about things that we see that are going on. We have to commit ourselves um, in that regard. And I think that's very, very important. And that should be governed from our Christian stance more than anything else. Eric, thank you so much. You know, as you were sharing there, it, it made me think of a, a late theologian, a wonderful African-American theologian by the name of James Cone, who wrote a book several years ago called The Cross and the Lynching Tree and made a direct connection between the violence of the crucifixion and, and the violence of the cross um, to, um, to lynchings and other forms of oppressive and systemic racism um, in, in the United States. And so there is a, as you've said, Derek, a very, very strong biblical and theo theological warrant for this work to dismantle uh, racist systems and, uh, uh, you know, oppressive uh, systems as well. And I just want you to know how grateful we are for sharing from your heart. Um, I am deeply grateful for our friendship. And I'm wondering, Derek, if you would close us in prayer today. Yes, sir. Father, before we do the prayer, can I, can I, I want to just give my email address, because I know some people who may have, have, may have other questions. I know we're out of time. And I'm happy to engage in conversation. So it's, it's Derek, D-A-R-R-I-C-K, D-A-R-R-I-C-K, McGee, M-C-G-H-E-E. -E. Again, M-C-G-H-E-E. -E. So Derek McGee at gmail.com. If you email me the question or you email me, there, thank you for putting that up there, Mandy. I'm happy to engage in the conversation. We'll see where it goes from there. But once again, thank you so much for the honor and the privilege to be here, Father Day, Mother Abby, Jim Messer, if you still don't, thank you for the invitation. And in honor and respect of what Father Dave actually do, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. God, I thank you for the chance to be able to be in fellowship with these, my brothers and sisters. A few that I know, many I do not know. But I thank you that our love for you and our love for community has knitted our souls together. I pray that today's time was fruitful and beneficial. I thank you for the vision behind it. I thank you for St. John's. I thank you for their willingness to engage in such a conversation and a topic. I pray that as we press forward, that we as a people would always be led by the spirit and that we would not be afraid to engage in those things that are uncomfortable, but necessary. Thank you for our, our example through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you for allowing us to have a heart to follow that example. I pray that you will continue to bless St. John, the work that is doing in this community, in the state, and in this world. I pray that you continue to allow us to be a beacon of hope as individuals and as, as the local church. I pray that you get the glory out of all that we do. We honor you, we appreciate you, we thank you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, Derek, we honor you and we appreciate you. Uh, so grateful for your time and your passion. Um, I, I have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the first is I want everyone on this meeting to be aware that St. John's is early in the process. We're working on a vestry level of setting up a discernment team, very similar actually to the same gender marriage consultation to discern ways that St. John's can uh, both be a, um, a, a community that works to dismantle racism and also to act 
Um, so, you know, to change at a heart level, but also change on an action level. So I, I want you to be aware that that group is being formed and will lead the congregation through a period of discernment. It will not be as long as the same gender marriage consultation. Um, we all sense a, a great urgency that we want to do this work over the next six months or so. So we'll stay in touch with the congregation about that discernment team taking shape. Um, I also want you to know that uh, this coming Wednesday, we will gather for a, uh, a longer forum about our regathering plan. That will begin at six o'clock. And then I will be teaching on what we're calling the next normal, where God is gonna lead us from this wilderness place to the promised land. And that will be from 6.30 to 7.30. I encourage you all to check out the St. John's Church at Home web, uh, webpage where you can keep up with the various activities during the week. And Derek, once again, we're so grateful for your leadership and your ministry in our community. Thank you, my friend. Okay, God bless you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Derek, so much. Thank you Appreciate all. Appreciate it. God bless you all. Take care. Happy Sunday. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Claire, go crazy. <laughs>